Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the third night of the Association for Art History's first Art History Festival. For those of you who are only being introduced to the association now, we are the subject association for art history in the UK. And we lead the collective effort in this country to advance the study and practice of art history. Our programs serve those in the education and, prof and professional sectors, academics, students of all ages, and curators, as well as anyone with an interest in art, design, or architecture. The Art History Festival is for everyone, and we've organized presentations that we hope will appeal to those with varied interests and levels of familiarity with our subject. Uh, very closely related to art history is the field of design history, and we are pleased to partner with the Design History Society to present this festival. We're even more pleased that the Society's chair, Claire O. Mahoney, is joining us tonight for her presentation, when she'll talk about everyday objects around us, the memories and associations they evoke. We'll be in good hands with this talk as Claire is the Associate Professor of the History of Art and Design in the Department for Continuing Education at the University of Oxford, where she founded and directs the MST in the History of Design. In addition to chairing the Design History Society, she is an editor of the Society's Journal of Design History. Claire's research explores entanglements of identity politics, objects, and place. Her latest publication projects are a collective volume of essays exploring the culture history of furniture since 1900 and chapters on sensorial and interiors in the 1925 Paris Exposition and the representation of the craft worker in collective volumes edited by John Potvin and Clive Edwards. So with that, I'll hand it over to Claire. Uh, we'll speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have a time for questions and answers. As a reminder, as you know, please do use the Q&A function for that and I will see you uh, in a bit after Claire's talk. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation this evening. As Greg said, I'm Claire, um, I have the privilege of chairing the society and thank you so much for joining us to talk about uh, things and their roles in our life. So I'm just sharing the screen now that hopefully everyone can see. Uh, so if I may, I will go back one slide uh, and then uh, we can start our conversation. I'm just trying to go there. So uh, I want to begin by introducing my fellow trustee, Alton Ogosna, who's with us today, um, who is our communications trustee, but also the creator of the wonderful image through which we attracted you to this conversation. Um, I wonder, you might like to say a few words, Alton, about your inspiration for making this. We've had various conversations about what we wanted to achieve in this event, and out of that, you created this lovely image. I mean, would you like to tell us for a moment what were your inspirations? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the main inspiration behind um, the logo was, um, it's not kind of a logo, but it's more like a, a brand image. It was this object called um, Iti Tamat, which was used um, by the peoples of the Pacific Northwest um, on the Columbia Plateau. And especially the object was used by young women uh, of, of these communities who would begin knotting um, these fibers to mark important moments in their lives. Uh, and throughout their lives, they would um, collect this string, uh, which would eventually turn into a um, huge ball. Um, and for every specific memory, they would um, do a different knot. Sometimes they would add uh, beads into it to kind of mark that um, special day. And of course, in the oral tradition, they would always remember uh, the significance of um, each uh, knot. Um, so I thought um, as a memory object, it was a very relevant um, thing to represent um, with what we're trying to do with remembering things. That kind of um, very silent, um, um, it, the silent way objects kind of witness those important moments of our lives. Um, yeah, that was the inspiration behind it. Thank you so much for creating the image and sharing those thoughts with us about it. 
I think it was out of these kinds of informal conversations that uh, we've put together this idea of a sort of public history interactive project. So a number of you have very kindly submitted a set of images and reflections on objects that have been witnesses to your lives that are sort of knots in the memory, such as we've been uh, inspired by in Alton's wonderful uh, graphic design. And I thought in order to sort of kick us off to reflect on those contributions, it was only fair that I should do something of my own, uh, which is to take a, a set of objects which uh, seemingly are quite mundane, but actually speak to quite rich moments, cathartic transitions in life experience. But I have to also pay homage to my formation um, as an art historian, as well as a design historian. And I thought I'd start with a couple of rather less everyday objects, quite elite objects, but that nonetheless set up this relationship between art historical methods and the world of design history, and this connectivity around the idea of storytelling and which stories get told by whom through these attentive experiences of objects. And I just thought I'd start with this wonderful uh, uh, lacquer box created by one of the most uh, exquisite craftspersons of, of lacquerware in Japan, uh, Ogata Korin, uh, precisely because it captures a core concept that I hope to explore with you all tonight, which is this idea of the animated life of things. The tsukugami uh, is, is the Japanese characterization of this. It's based on this wonderful ninth century story, the tales of Issei, both the box and this turn of phrase. Uh, in which you have a wandering aristocratic poet who, as he passes over an eight plank bridge and sees the beauty of an iris bloom, reflects on his sense of loss at having departed from his lover. So that cathartic sensorial moment of memory making is something which Corinne then translates into this exquisite writing box in which you see the planks of the, the eight planks of the, the water crossing, you sense that exquisite uh, visceral sensorial experience, as well as the visuality of irises and reflection and the movement of water. And all of that contains the objects through which one might write down the reflected uh, recollection of that moment of emotion and feeling. So the box, the object, the very diligent, lengthy, demanding process of lacquerware, which often involves applications of resin you know, 40, 50 times in order to achieve this exquisite layered surface, becomes a kind of time capsule of the multiple participants in this memory. The ninth century poet, as he recalls his love, uh, the, the 17th century maker, as the lacquerware process allows him to reflect on that poetic moment. And indeed, we as spectators, as participants uh, observing this object, can also re-enter that suspended memory recollection. Now, the Tokugami um, uh, precept, however, is not just about aristocrats wandering and creating exqui exquisite national treasures, as this object uh, has been accorded that status. They also are inhabitants of mundane household objects. The idea is that after 99 years, any tool or object or household um, item becomes spiritually animated. It takes on a life of its own. And those of us who wrestle with computers and complicated kitchenware, I think are cognizant that this is a very resonant storytelling metaphor, that objects can be both spiritual guides, but also somewhat malevolent uh, 
entanglers in our, our plans. And I think that idea is important to our conversation today. I also want to signal this is a, a very rich um, presence in the life of so many uh, different spaces and uh, kinds of objects. Any of you who had the pleasure of visiting the Musée Carnavalet in Paris will recollect this famous bedroom, cork lined in order to protect its inhabitant, the rather oversensitized uh, writer Marcel Proust, deeply asthmatic, very fragile in his mental and physical health. Uh, he describes this room as being one which inspires him not by being perfectly orchestrated to reflect his character, but precisely because these objects, again, have a life of their own, a presence. And this is Proust recalling his inhabitation of that room. It was precisely through these things which were not there for my convenience, but seemed to have come there for their own pleasure that my room for me acquired its beauty. All those things which not only could not answer any of my needs, but were even an impediment, however slight, to their satisfaction. Peopled my room with thoughts somehow personal, with that air of having chosen to live there and delighting in it, which often the trees in a clearing and the flowers on the roadsides or on old walls have. They filled it with a silent and multifarious life, with a mystery in which my person found itself lost and charmed at the same time. So objects, be they elevated exquisite collector's items, or the most humble kitchen utensil, often disposable, uh, can be evocators of this rich animated exchange between object and subject. So what I've chosen as my case study is precisely a very humble object indeed, a set of old salt and pepper shakers, uh, which are were my selection for an, a thing to remember. And here I'm very much inspired by the work of a key design historian for my own formation, Judy Atfield, who writes this wonderful book called Wild Things, The Material Culture of Everyday Life, uh, part of a cultural history uh, series entitled Materializing Culture. And in that, she writes a wonderful meditation on the intersectionality between the different disciplines of design history, of art history, of material culture studies, of environmental design. It is precisely the ways in which objects and places are societally experienced that is perhaps the slight shift of focus that I think design history has really tried to contribute to this festival. Uh, one may well wish to celebrate uh, exquisite salt cellars such as Benvenuto Cellini in his uh, famous volume about the craftsman uh, describes this wondrous process of creating a present for uh, the King of France, François Ier, given by Cardinal Hippolyto d'Este, uh, wherein sea gods bring together this golden basin of salt and a, a little nymph sits on a, a temple which houses pepper. And this would provide uh, gastronomic and cultural exchanges. Uh, between the Vatican, uh, the, the Italian city-states, and the great Catholic King of France, uh, François Ier. So I've chosen salt and pepper as a motif, both as a culinary history, as well as a uh, cultural history of things. And I think it's really important to remember that the receptacles which hold these uh, flavorings are themselves seasoned by the histories of salt and pepper. Tragic as well as enriching, one has only to think of the 
activism of Mohandas Gandhi in 1930, choosing salt making as the manifestation of nonviolent civil disobedience, but right the way through to these rather absurd um, operettas that were uh, celebrating the pepper sauce that is the famous uh, seasoning in Louisiana where some of my predecessors uh, lived and these extraordinary salt caves out of which uh, these rich flavors come wherein one often sacrificed one's life. These are quite risky environments to work. And I think this is another core element of design history's contribution is to ask us to reflect on what the base materials involved in the creation of objects of use or objects of consumption. And I think that's something that in our current climate emergency, we are thinking about more and more and with more anxiety, perhaps. And equally, the ways in which food, as well as the, the tableware and, and accoutrement of dining, are very important markers of cultural status. And I'm just showing you here a page out of a very impactful volume by Pierre Bourdieu descri describing distinction. And this is a, an English translation of his A Natural Grid, but I also include a recent one by a California foodie uh, trying to translate this into 2021 vocabularies of dining and the ways in which the typologies of food, as well as the, the receptacles upon which it is displayed, become important markers of social distinction, of social status. The speed with which they are prepared or consumed are disproportionately equivalent to the status of, of the diner and the, the receptacle as well. So this is a wonderful study by Pierre Laszlo reflecting how salt sellers really for him come into three categories. There's the wedding list luxury object, and that is a, a category that I invite you to be challenged upon by the, the object that I've chosen as my memoryful one, because it is referencing luxury, but in practice is quite a, a lower middle class, upper working class gift in many ways. Uh, but many assault sellers, as we've seen from the, the extraordinary Tini one, are lavish. Uh, and that is a tradition that continues in the work of Bacar, Christophe, Corning, Dame. But they can be industrial products as well. Elegant, handsome, well-conceived manifestations of modernist good design. Uh, or indeed, they can be reflections of a, a sort of nostalgic return to the artisanal made in wood or earthenware, handcrafted. These are all signifiers of different ways in which objects speak to the dining experience. And it's worth reflecting on the format of the salt being transfigured over the course of history. If one looks at the 1600 uh, salt cellar made for a, a, a affluent family in Portugal, the Fonsecas, uh, one has a sense of the salt pillar still being the core manifestation of this key savoury condiment. And indeed that that pillar was often in a block form. Importantly, this kind of salt cellar was placed at the right hand of the, the master implicitly of the household, hopefully the mistress in a number of cases as well they then would distribute it to the guests. So it was a perfect manifestation of a societal relationship of players between the empowered head of table, as it were, and then the beneficence granting that to others. Interestingly, 19th century French traditions shift that balance. Now, at the moment in which you're entering into a kind of bourgeois, uh, spreading out of, of opulent opportunity, one of the ways in which you manifest your status is to provide each diner with an individual salt cellar. So it is not the beneficent gift 
that you circulate around the table, but rather that 19th century consumer uh, dissemination of multiple objects that signifies the generosity of the host. And I think that's something which then sort of filters into more modest circumstances. These are examples of molded glass receptacles that uh, mix the two traditions. On the one hand, you've got some examples with a silver rim, referencing back to that head of table, those two examples will be placed at the host's seating, whereas this, the non-ornamented, non-silverware embellished examples would be positioned next to the guests. So I think they're wonderful examples of how we get a glimpse of delicious meals, given that I'm speaking to you at uh, just before at the dining hour, that seemed an opposite choice as well. And these, I think, lead us on to a whole set of other fascinating hybrid manifestations. I couldn't resist this example that's in the Cooper Hewitt, Hewitt um, Smithsonian collection in New York. It was in fact a trophy uh, that was designed by the great um, Art Deco uh, French uh, silversmith, Jean-Lise Puyfocat, uh, who created it as the, the sort of lavish demonstration of interwar sporting excellence. It was a competition won at the Palais de Glace in Paris in 1923. And look at the kind of luxury materials it's composed of. Lapis lazuli, rock crystal, enamel, marble but it's translated from that individual achievement that might gather dust if placed in a cabinet and instead made the centerpiece of the table by the rather immodest hope, host. And in it, you would put uh, your salt that then uh, could be distributed around um, through, through uh, smaller selections. So again, that sense of the demonstration of status very much being in play. I think all of these conventions get very much transfigured by the industrial process of salt production. And I just give you an example here from America of one of the sort of core brands of salt at that um, pivotal moment of the 19 teens, when by adding an agent, originally it was magnesium carbonate, um, it's now is calcium silicate, you move away from having that sort of little spoon distribution that has become very vogueish in sort of hipster cafes now. But one of the sort of great, uh, just before the First World War in inverted commas advancements was managing to create a salt receptacle that could be widely distributed wherein the salt didn't become impacted back into a block and then become problematic and lose some of its savoury flavour. Uh, and this leads to a whole set of campaigns which I think give us a fascinating glimpse of the different decorums, the different attitudes towards salt distribution. Uh, the one on the left is very much from the, the sort of 20s moment, as you can tell from the, the dress of the two uh, commentators. And wouldn't you think she'd use Morton salt, especially in weather like this? Yes, somebody ought to tell her that when it rains, it pours. So here, actually, we've been invited to think that using sort of elegant wedding gift salt sellers was quite a backwards practice at this point. Uh, much more up-to-date modern interwar to have a, a Morton salt uh, distribution. Although I think it's unlikely that any hostess of the 20s would have wanted to put such an item on the table itself. And I think that's something that the post-war advertisement that I'm showing you is more indicative of, that there is a sort of transition from the purposeful receptacle that is useful in the kitchen cooking process and then a set of uh, very modest, but decorative, attractive salt and pepper shakers that would go for the guest um, or the family to use at table. So I think there are lots of sort of interesting transitions there between the contents and the objects themselves. 
and I couldn't resist these, I am fascinated to discover that there are a whole set of international salt and pepper shaker museums worldwide. Uh, a sort of initial one was uh, forged in Tennessee in Gatlinburg by an anthropologist who was fascinated, Andrea Ludden, at this uh, American habit of collecting salt and pepper shakers from various touristic destinations. And this then engendered a whole set of different salt and pepper shaker museums in Guadalest in Spain, in Hadera in Israel, in Menarca in Cyprus. So there is a kind of way in which salt and pepper shakers have come a very long way from that grand uh, Portuguese huge object, or indeed the Puifosa. Um, uh, skating trophy to instead being a quite uh, obsolete uh, collectible that one sort of acquires uh, to to recollect the process of voyaging. So just to end my little section, I wanted very quickly to talk about my pair, uh, precisely because I think they alert us to a core element of humble everyday household objects and the way in which they take on that Japanese animation or that Proustian power of recollection. And that's to invite us to think about the process of gifting and the selection of wedding gifts. And again, I can't resist uh, these extraordinary advertisements that litter the pages of most post-war uh, women's magazines or home uh, and garden publications uh, that signal to the young prospective couple the contract that is embedded in the exchange of silver. Reed and Barton promoted, oh, promise me, Reed and Barton Sterling, sweet nothings are nice, but there's a time when a girl has to lead up to sweet somethings like Reed and Barton Sterling. I think this is where we get into a really quite interesting problematic cultural practice around the giving of salt cellars and salt and pepper shakers as being one of uh, the enormous enumeration of objects that one might have on a wedding list. And I think this is where oral history is so much fun. Uh, when I teach a class on this, I embarked on doing a set of oral history questionnaire interviews reflecting on wedding gifts. Uh, and I just choose a selection of three that I, I managed to cull um, last year. Uh, different attitudes towards the propriety of expectation of being given a silver salt and pepper shaker. Mm. Uh, my parents can't quite remember, but I don't think they had a wedding list. However, many people did ask what they were collecting, which seems to have been mainly kitchenware, prestige saucepans and utensils. By the time I was attending weddings in the 1990s, people always seemed to have a list. And that's a 30 year old English woman living with a partner. A 30 year old Scott uh, married man says, yes, I am married. No, we did not have a list, a terrible thing, like a toddler demanding presents. No, I would never choose a present off a registry list, too impersonal. And then a 50 year old American married uh, person, who, that lady said, oh, everyone had a wedding list. I always choose something off the list that I know the couple want. So I think this is a wonderful example of the way in which the cultural practices of choosing a pattern, deciding whether you opt for the sort of toddler attitude or, or whether you regard that as a help to your guests at the wedding. Um, so the, the salt sellers that I've chosen uh, were given in relationship to the flatware that the, the bride and groom had selected, which was known as craftsmen, very much invoking 18th century English silver, and that the sobriety of this pair of salt and pepper shakers was seen to reflect that character. But they're hollowware. Uh, so that's a quite modest, um, non-weighted silver. It's effectively a skin of uh, uh, electroplated embellishment on a very base metal underneath, as you can see from these various objects um, that are smashed apart in the image on the far side. Uh, so Fisher Silversmiths, which is founded by Smams Fisher in Providence, Rhode Island, 
was successful enough with the creation of these um, sort of lower middle class, upper working class objects that he could expand to a Jersey City uh, firm. Uh, and in the 1930s, they mixed and matched rather Baroque styles with some of these rather more sober 18th century stylings. And I think this is, again, where the oral history uh, manifestation can be so interesting. That's just to give you a glimpse of the questions I asked of people. These were the answers to the, the gift uh, receiver of this salt and pepper shaker. Uh, in Baton Rouge, the local jewelry and tableware store called Riders gave every girl a silver teaspoon for their high school graduation. I did not want it particularly, but my mother insisted that we go and choose one. She encouraged me to choose a very ornate pattern, like the silver flatware and china service she gradually purchased out of the grocery money in at Christmas. In the 1920s, when she married, no one was given all those things. After the war, everyone could afford them. Each year, my parents got me another piece. When my fiancé and I were choosing our registry list, we much preferred the craftsman pattern. We liked its English style of elegant simplicity. Riders allowed us to return all the Baroque place settings and replace them with craftsman ones. So we've got a fascinating glimpse there of a whole set of cultural rituals around wedding gifts and around silver patterns. The gift itself, all my parents' friends had already given us so many silver place settings and the full china service. My brother and his wife chose the salt and pepper shakers in a similar style to our craftsman place settings and had them engraved with the R monogram. As the groom's family could not travel to Louisiana, so my brother was best man, he and his wife hosted our rehearsal supper. That was their real gift to us, the givers. My brother had finished two years, of, uh, two years tour in the Air Force and worked in New Orleans for a couple of years. Then he got a chance to return to Baton Rouge. Our mother rejoiced and worked for the rest of his life as representative for a consulting company. So chemical engineers sold materials and advice to various Louisiana companies, sugar cane mills, oil His wife was an elementary school teacher. I don't think she liked it. Um, she stopped before they were married in March. So we've got an extraordinary glimpse there of a whole intersection of aspiration, expectations, memories about the meal, the rehearsal supper before the wedding, being much more impregnated in these objects than the actual value of the silver, the weight of the silver, the fact that they aren't actually craftsmen uh, pattern, but that they resonated was indicative of having looked at, listened to, participated in that process of pattern choosing for a wedding list. Now, these objects came into my possession on my 25th anniversary, uh, the silver anniversary, and I can't treasure them more than anything else that I can think of, precisely because they are part of this whole set of gift givings that are about the time spent together, the memory forged, the animation of the object by that cultural exchange, and even more so in this second gift giving, by shifting it from the sort of altruism egotism as Gregson and crew describe the process of gift giving as a social exchange, instead into uh, a second-hand gift which is taking delight in serendipitously finding the perfect gift for a loved one. The gift which is unique, spontaneous, a treat, just right. Here too we have a search process that is devoid of the notions of drudge and labour, which typify, typify the account of gift buying, gift buying in first cycle spaces, but which is characterised by fun, delight and pleasure. So I think this ties into a whole culture of the animation, the valorization of the imperfect object that is enriched, ennobled, encoded by that process of transference, of repair.
And I'm celebrating here a, a wonderful dissertation project. One of my students a couple of years ago, um, Katie Tragedian did on visible mending, but also part of a wider project of repairing, which is part of our high streets now, dare I say it, with the anxieties about supply chain and the rest, um, maybe uh, uh, will come back into play, even for people who don't have that rich of memory filled animated objects. Now, I did to, to close by really just thanking everyone for uh, sending in these four objects. And I noticed there's one contribution in the, the um, question and answers. Please do add some more, uh, but I'll very quickly walk through the ones that were sent in advance and then let's open it up to, to questions. So we had these four I chose that I think capture this wonderful way in which objects are uh, through their sensorial experience, through the lives of interaction, capture the world of experience. Um, so if I just very quickly walk through the first, which is a camera, uh, really interesting to think of the, the questions that I, I hope you all saw that I'd asked of you, inviting us to think about the materiality of the object. Where is it manufactured? What is it made of? Think about its size. Where does it live now, as well as where was it used? Is it a design or not? I think one of the big things that I treasure from Atfield's approach to design history and material culture is to move away from the concept of good design, but rather seeing all objects as having this energy, this presence, this manifestation of history and storytelling. And indeed, this wonderful evocation of a particular life experience of the ways in which cameras are part of the way in which this parent has transmitted a love of things and visuality and photography as a, a capturer of the moment. Uh, our next object is a, a prayer cushion. Uh, made out of wool and hessian uh, by hand in the 1970s in a very particular village uh, with a very particular set of makers. Uh, it's got uh, a locatedness both within a physical environment but also within a cultural practice, which is about uh, a religiosic experience. Uh, to what extent does one regard it as design? There was a generation of design historians for whom this kind of object was beyond the pale. This was craft. This was not considered part of the, the history of good design made by, made by uh, ce celebrated makers. And I think that's a really important uh, widening and recuperation of the field of recent years. And this wonderful set of recollections uh, about the, the original maker, but also the sort of steward, the custodian of that memory um, by subsequent users of the cushion or observers of the cushion. Uh, and that sense of, in practice, the woman for whom this memory was viscerally real, found the process of making too emotionally charged and engaged other members of the community involved in that, I think is an extraordinarily poignant recollection. And the last one, uh, a set of uh, uh, silver tongues uh, for sugar, uh, a whole set of uh, different pairs available throughout London, uh, believed to be from the 1880s, uh, we don't need a named maker, but we recognize by the tactility of the made object, the presence of that um, skilled hand. And indeed this extraordinary recollection of the loss, the covetedness, the challenges of inheritance, 
Um, and indeed, the inheritance is not just of the object across a family, but also the sense of anxiety of the inheritance of the addiction to sugar or salt that we all have, the culinary traditions that are so much part of our identity politics, but how those play out in, in problematic ways in the exchange of goods as well. And then our last example, this wonderful other vision of the lost object or the exchanged or the transmuted, the translated object, a set of furniture uh, that have been abandoned, made of wooden parts, um, which have been part of this um, contributor's own digital set of recollections, chairs left behind. And that question of at what point do objects become out of use or do they then translate into new uses? And I think that sense that abandoned chairs often have a new life. I'm sitting beside a chair that I collected off the street as a student in London in the 1990s that I recovered and reworked myself. And that has been a chair that I've worked on for most of my academic career. And that's wonderful to think that that moment of uh, furniture poverty actually translated into a creative process. And I think that sense of the adaptation and hybridity is wonderfully captured in these uh, recollected objects. And I think that uh, afterlife that this contributor speaks to is exactly something that I share. Um, so I'll, I'll just unshare my slides now um, and then we can uh, join in with the uh, question and answer session if I can uh, and let's see what we've um, got in the Q&A. We have got one here, um, this is from John, he said his, his remembered object would be a fossilized calyx flower head of a sponge plant about 50 million years old. I found it on a South End beach when I was eight. I lost it, left it on a train 40 years later. How were visually engaging fossil, fossils, such as coiled and ammonites, regarded and valued through, through the ages, particularly before the mid 19th century, when geologists persuaded most viewers that these were once prehistoric living objects? Oh, that's a great quote. Thank you, John. That's amazing. So lo lovely to have connected to this relationship with the natural world as well, where we began. And I, I think, I mean, again, we have lots of experts on the call, but what immediately leaps to my mind is um, a glassmaker who I work on, a man called Emil Galli. His first exhibition stand after the Franco-Prussian War, he decorates with ammonites because part of the way in which his circle of, of uh, makers coped with defeat was to start thinking about geologic time and the natural world. So the fact that you have been annexed to another nation and you know, lots of people have died and it's been this very traumatic experience, jumping back to those ciphers of this enormous trajectory of time was something that helped him in his own glass making process to manage, but also represent the challenges of his own age. So that's just one example of a you know, very eminent maker who was inspired by these kinds of objects. I'm also minded in my working job day, I very often am in the University Museum in Oxford, and there, all of the pillars in the upper level of this wonderful museum um, designed by Ruskin, working with various colleagues uh, in the um, geology faculty and the, the living sciences faculty. Each column is a different type of stone found in the British Isles, and those are encrusted with all of these different geological fossil things. And I think I hope all of us, as we walk along the side of buildings, if they've got stone casing or stone floors, not only run our hand alongside to get that sensorial pleasure, but look to see that 
trace of animated life, which the stasis of so, stone so often encapsulates. Mm. Um, so fabulous. Mm. Um, um, last I, thing, you haven't lost them, they're still inside. As yeah. my father would say, they're just misplaced. <laughs> <laughs> And Claire, did you say you have your own, uh, you have your own object? Well, I, it was the one that I was showing everyone. So that one, you have them, in, you have them right there. Um, so it was to give a sense of the lightness of them, but also the quite sort of curious issues of scale that we've been thinking about. I think for a 21st century household, that would feel like a quite oddly large salt and pepper shaker for most people. Um, and I thought that's where it would be quite fun to, to bring that up. Mm. But I don't, how often did you bring it? Oh, Greg, I don't know if you wanted to share. Sorry, Claire, I didn't want to interrupt, but from the beginning of your presentation, I've had so much resonances because um, so many resonances because my parents actually have an identical pair of salt and paper sh shakers and I've just been thinking about um, it's just a design it's just the way a designed object is as a mass-produced object and you know how how they can be ubiquitously present crossing boundaries national boundaries geographic boundaries cultural boundaries participating in various rituals or, or different contexts even I think the identical pair that my parents have must have been given to them as a wedding present I'm not sure but I'm very intrigued now I'm going to find out yes but they have their place in the um, in the living room in this lovely um, glass showcase that they're not used on a daily basis they're like heirlooms kept um... mm. <laughs> And to think that, and again, it's that wonderful mixture of, you know, when I was taught when dinosaurs roamed the earth, you know, one was given slide lists, five pages long, where you learned, you know, make a date, national school, size, medium collection, and you were done 30 second tests on those. And I think this is wonderfully indicative of, A, how problematic that thinking is, that there was a locality. These are movable goods that are translated and exchanged and shared. Um, and also that the makers themselves are extraordinarily, you know, Fischer is uh, a name that comes from Central Europe, which is an emigre designer who then gets settled in New York. The objects are bought by uh, a Cajun British transnational marriage. Now, there are these incredibly complicated geographies involved. The salt which was contained in them will, will have traveled as well. And I think that, that is an exciting part of what I think a lot of us are energized in design history at the moment is thinking about those intersections between the, the base matter out of which things are made and the processes of exchange and consumption and afterlife. And I'm interested yours were kept in a, a cupboard because what broke my heart when I got these, because I could remember these being kind of shiny and perfect and given to me by a family member you know, in their nineties now. And they um, had been carefully wrapped up in cellophane because in the post-war period, that was the protective material against tarnish which now has marked them quite severely. Mm. But I can't bear to remove the trace of that because I think that's such a fascinating glimpse of the, that they were for best and that that meant after a point at which there weren't huge family gatherings, they did become sort of lost in a different way. Um, wonderful. Mm. And Claire, you included something in your, uh, in your talk that was evocative for me. Uh, because I was born and grew up in Chicago, and that blue Morton salt container was ubiquitous. Uh, so they did a very good job convincing uh, middle America uh, in the second half of the 20th century that this is something that should be used in every household, and everyone had it, and it was just all over in that city. And even if you drove along one of the expressways where the factory was, there was a 60-foot painted sign of this girl umbrella, and strong evocations that these things have. Um, and, and it, it is of that phrase of your, the, the Proustian power of recollection. It does just set off 
so many associations when an object or, or thing or an image like that um, is brought to your attention. So. Maybe to continue with that. So, oh, sorry, Claire. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Um, to continue with that Prostein connection, I just wanted to mention another resonance that I had in your presentation, Claire. One of the objects that were shared with us, the camera case. Uh, yeah. um, we had a very similar one, if not identical this time. Um, that was my, grand, uh, my grandfather's, and I never got to meet him. Uh, he passed away when I was three, unfortunately. But um, that was kind of a keepsake for me that was um, left from my uh, grandfather. And the only association I could make with the object was its smell. And it had this very kind of chemical, dusty smell. And I always um, imagined that my grandfather smelled that way um, <laughs> in a very interesting way. The object somehow became um, kind of the absence. It, it kind of fulfilled the absence of my grandfather in a way, in a very similar way that was shared um, by Michaela. I think that was Michaela's object. Yes, I wasn't sure for, if I should disclose who should. I think everyone was fine about this. So, um, and Ezra's example of the furniture as well. I mean, it really touched me because um, the, the volume on cultural history of furniture that's coming out. Um, sadly, one of our contributors passed away while we were writing it. And I love that one of the last images we chose together was one that she'd taken under a motorway overpass where cast off furniture was being made into a homeless dwelling and that it, it nonetheless had the sort of interior coordination that implied different kinds of seating different kinds of social interchange and you know objects don't get lost they get refound and remade and you know as those chairs will have made much like my one that I had as a student desk chair now this is lovely I mean I, I have a more comfortable one now <laughs> but, but I do still find it uh, enormously uh, resonant with that that process of walking the city was part of writing the doctorate so finding that chair while doing that to, and that is a kind of urban tale isn't it that all students have to bring home some lost item and it become and then it becomes part of the exchange of student goods that when you shift flats that then gets transferred to someone and transferred to someone else and that um, passing on is part of the joy yeah we're, we're coming towards the end, about six minutes left, but um, there was something that I was thinking about, Claire, when you were speaking, and then Artem just mentioned it as well. It's just um, the ability of objects and for people that we've lost and how they become the substitute for them. We imbue them with that, um, which I think is probably something that's universal. I don't know, but I mean, I think, um, yeah, and I think about the, you know, how, um, you know, we're all temporal and we're all temporary and these objects just on and on and outlive the people and, and, and then at the same time stand in for them. And then they'll, they'll be go on and then have, have, you know, have that same power maybe with other people in the future. And we're just sort of temporary stewards of these things. We were imbuing them with this meaning for, for a short time before they then have meaning for somebody else and maybe associations with someone else who's, who's no longer there. I don't know, something I was just thinking about when you were talking. Absolutely, I think that's a, a great, and it is part of our you know, wonderful renaissance of interest in tracing family back through objects, that there may be family stories that are lost, that the object might have some index, indexical trace of, that then allows one to find a lost family story, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I see one more from Anne. Should we yes. maybe have to read out of that? So Anne said, when I was a kid, I played on a landing, pretending I was a pirate or a ship's captain below a fairly rustic wooden ship. When my aunt died, I asked for the ship. I don't have uh, many relatives from that side of the family. And I was feeling lonely. The ship is the Mayflower. The replica Mayflower, too, is a wonderful proof of the original design being excellent. 
All these years later, I found out that some distant relatives left Plymouth for the New World shortly after the Mayflower's voyages. Mm -hmm. Genetic testing has given 7,000 cousins in the US. I look at my Mayflower and think of them. How tremendous. Well, that's lovely. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I'm very much shared as well. My father also makes um, these kinds of models. So uh, it's a, a running joke amongst the, the trustees about which one will I have behind me normally when I'm in other parts of the house. So that's a lovely, but again, that uh, glimpse that then leads you to follow up the life story of the family. Thank you for sharing that. And to our four for the pictures, they were great. I mean, one of the things I wonder if by way of conclusion, we're regarding this as the start of a public conversation, if possible. Um, Artan, as our communications officer with our, our administrator, Jenna Alsop, and I will be working to try and just celebrate the stories that remembered objects hold. So if you go back to the festival website, you'll see there is a link there where you can drop in um, details of an object and share them. And our hope is to make this be a kind of regular part of the Design History Society Instagram account that will share your stories on and thereby sort of start circulating a conversation. So maybe you'll find your 7,000 cousins, Anne, you never know. Um, and other, other examples. Um, I'm also going to sit with my, my chair hat on. I should probably put in the Q&A a link tree. Um, I wonder if I can uh, copy that over uh, that I had in the PowerPoint presentation so that if you do want to um, get in touch with the society or um, apply for our grants or join in any of our educational activities, uh, you can uh, come along, you'd be most welcome. So if I put that, I wonder if I can do that. And while you're doing that, Claire, can I just uh, remind people that for those who are interested in design, um, Claire is going to be chairing a panel uh, at a session on Saturday noon at the National Gallery. Two colleagues from the uh, the Design History Society speaking to Christine Chichinska, who's a senior curator of Africa and, Dias and Diaspora Textiles and Fashion at the, at the V&A Museum. And they're going to be talking about Africa fashion, African fashion and its diasporas. Um, and there are still tickets available for that. Um, so do have a look at the at the website and and sign up and join us we'd love to see you there so please don't and i'm really looking forward again very much a conversation um share is a, a research fellow there and, and was a former student of mine so there's lots of nice synergies there too and sarah's given us one last one about painful memories as well yeah that people fight over objects but hopefully um, these conversations will allow us to reunite or, or to purge those malevolent spirits with which we began.